Welcome everybody back here on Siegel Talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the greatest center CUNY in Midtown, Manhattan, part of the City University. And uh, we are continuing our long engagement since March, since the last weeks of March, uh, um, exploring um, that time of Corona, the place theater and arts and performance has in it. And uh, though we listen to the voices of artists and uh, the workers in the vineyard um, of, of theater. Um, after our break in uh, September, we went back and enlarged a little bit our view. We on sessions already on dramaturgy, on theater of the real um, documentary theater with Carol Martin. We talking to producers, uh, curators, um, and um, we think these are artists, theater artists in that uh, definition of, uh, of Joseph Boys of an enlarged understanding of um, what we are doing and um, and I think um, what uh, Diane Taylor always reminded us that uh, what is performance art has many many roots and what is performance art and theater and how it's created and put together also has many many members of a team and they're all of significance. Uh, with us today we have someone I think is a very significant voice an important voice and also in a way a unique voice uh, within uh, the field of research um, of theater. Uh, Betty Ferdman, she is here um, uh, with us and she herself um, is a practitioner, started out with physical theater, if I understand and remember right, also with clowning, but then went into uh, a field that perhaps called her more, which is the research and also thinking about the field of theater performance, the philosophy of it, but also her true love to teach and to, to, to discuss and engage um, in a discourse um, with theater artists, but also um, with um, um, students and people. So we hear a little bit about her. Betty, first, thank you for, for joining us. It's great that you could take time out, even at the end of the semester, I know how hard it is. Uh, Bertie is an associate professor at the Borough Manhattan Community College, BMCC. And she also teaches at the Columbia University School um, of the Arts. And I hear uh, from many people how, how brilliant uh, your, uh, your work there is and how influential um, it is. She uh, researched uh, uh, on the field of site-based performance, which is an interesting word, uh, urban dramaturgies and curating performance. The idea, who curates? Who is the curator? Why do they do what? So things also we, in a way, um, here um, uh, focus on. She uh, has some significant uh, publication, the Bloomsbury Handbook to Performance Art. Um, she did together with Joanna Sukic, um, Off-Sites, Contemporary Performance, Beyond Site-Specific. And I think this is what we will talk about, a very significant look, I think, on that very important field that defines, in a way, contemporary theater and um, also uh, many, many other things, curating life arts, uh, critical perspective essays, conversation on theater, on theory and practice. And she has been published in uh, TDR, the great TDR, uh, PAJ, the wonderful one, HowlRound actually here, and also Theater Journal, Theater Survey, everything, performance research. And currently she's working with Peter Eckersall on a book, Curating Dramaturgies, which will come out by Rutledge in 21, where they talk to a big number of curators about their practice and why, what we do here to, to listen and to understand um, the form um, we are engaging with. So this was a lot. We always say this is about radical listening and then I go on and on and on in the beginning. But um, Bati, really, um, thank you for taking uh, the time. Um, where are you now? Uh, oh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's always an honor and a pleasure. Uh, to be part of the Martin Siegel Theater Center series. I listen to quite a few of them, uh, especially when we're in quarantine. Uh, and this is uh, my kitchen. <laughs> and are you in Puerto Rico, in France? Oh, no, no. Uh, Brooklyn, New York, Park Slope. Brooklyn, New York, Park Slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just told us that, you know, that uh, the big... Uh, um, astronomical lines so in, in Puerto Rico, it collapsed, right? The big... Uh, Yes, in, we um, the the observ the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. It's very sad, actually. It just collapsed a few days ago, um, and yeah, we, we were talking before. My husband just texted had texted me a photo of when I was there when I was twenty five. Um, it's it's crazy. I mean, insane that this just happened, like right now. It's Luckily, no, no, yeah, nobody was hurt, but it's really tragic. 
It's, it's I think, it's actually one of the biggest observatories in the world. Yeah, it is. It was. And I think even a James Bond film yes. was filmed. I know you have deep roots to Puerto Rico where your family lives. But it's also a sign that something that observed the universe collapsed. And uh, maybe that is a good, a good symbol um, to start this talk. Um, the universe of theater performance, you know, what, what, what do you think of it? You know, um, uh, what uh, is it collapsed? It, it collapsing is completely closed here and it will be closed perhaps till, uh, till next fall. There is some uh, uh, news that Hugh Jackman will play the music man in September next year on Broadway, but nobody knows um, what will happen and how safe it will be. So what are, what are your thoughts on the theater and performance? Well, it's funny that you mentioned, I mean, it's kind of tragic. And I was thinking, and then you mentioned Broadway, and I was thinking, um, uh, I don't know that I, I've been kind of following the news a little bit on it, um, but I don't know that they're going to rebuild it or that I'm talking about the, the conservatory. I, I don't know about yeah. Broadway, but, uh, or that they have the money to rebuild it or to maintain it the way it was. Um, and I guess that's what you mean by a good metaphor for uh the theatrical landscape um because i guess uh we're gonna have to rebuild from the ground up uh and i don't know where the money is gonna come from or what kind of institutional frameworks gonna, they're going to create to sustain a theater um you know in the ways that people want to have i guess theater because it's been kind of imposed been imposed on us for a while um so yeah i guess um we'll, we'll, people, artists are gonna have to reinvent we talk about that in in my columbia class a lot and i think wow we have a great uh future in our hands with them they all i mean they think about these things all the time so uh, i think we you're right we are in a historic moment and we're going to see a lot of changes we're not going to go back to what was their artists are going to rethink what to do and how to do it and with whom and for whom and yeah. Well, what do you think? What, what, what will be the changes? What will we see? Well, um, <laughs> maybe I can start by telling you what I saw this morning. Uh, uh, it's a big question. Uh, I was just this morning, I wake up very early and um, some, I don't know why I don't often do this, but I watched um, Bibi Telas, she's an Argentine director doing Biodrama, and uh, they were supposed to premiere Blood Wedding, Bodas de Sangre, with Cecilia Roth, and very kind of famous uh, ensemble. I think it was back in, I don't remember, a few months ago, and obviously they couldn't do it, so they came up with I don't know how they quarantined the actors, but they filmed, they're doing it in three parts and it's, it was incredible. It was, it wasn't film, but it wasn't theater. It was something that they did on their own on the stage that was very, very intimate. Um, and yet it's recorded, we can all watch it. So the, I watched it because I wanna see it live. The, the part two is coming out. Uh, I think it's uh, Saturday, tomorrow, today, Friday, yeah. So I wanted to make sure I saw part one and um, going back to your bigger question about what, how, what it's gonna be, I just think that people are going to have to use the, the what's available to them um, and they're gonna have to go off site. They're gonna have to use theaters in new ways, use spaces in new ways, um, engage with, their own communities um, and find ways of being more human, even through technology. It was incredibly human, this, this performance. Yeah, it was very honest. It's funny, there's nothing fake about it, which is, well, I don't know how much you want me to talk, but it, um, when we, it, I was paying attention to the way they were performing um, on camera in this bare stage with nobody around. And they were talking about real events of their lives that were quite tragic. Um, and it was, it was a performance of the real. We were talking about this before, about the kind of the authenticity. So I think maybe things are gonna, it's a time for things to be more authentic mm -hmm. through performance, through spectacle actually. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that somehow we our radar of uh, detecting what's real, what's not, what is uh, essential, <laughs> what's important is is being you know it's going to be function on a on a better better software. Your book offsides mm -hmm. in a way um, dealt and looked at that field in a way you anticipated perhaps one could even say you know this this field what is now um, being practiced by when I, we've talked over 100 um, theater artists uh, um, 150 actually 180 and the production that were done in a way would fall most probably under your uh, category when you created that idea of the off offside and um, tell us a little bit what is that and why do you think this is important? Why should we read your book? Well, I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know if you should or shouldn't read my book, but I definitely <clears throat> think that the notion of off-sites, it's incredibly important to the history of theater and performance. I mean, first of all, theater with a capital T is an invented notion that comes from Western settler colonialism that kind of stems from the history of European theater as they created it and kind of settled it around the world. Um, and that's not the notion of performance at all as it was invented by humans. Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, the notion of storytelling embodiment and celebration and being together has been going on since Homo sapiens existed and it's, um, always been done off-site. There's no building, proscenium stage, fourth wall. Uh, the notion of wanting to engage with others in an authentic human way is, um, is, a, is a human need. Um, and the, the artists for, for so long, whether, I mean, of course I am, in the book I'm engaging with the notion of site specificity. So I'm engaging with it through histories of visual art discourse, which come from uh, minimalist art uh, because they're so obsessed with the autonomous realm of the artwork being separate from reality. And then that you know, kind of gets all enmeshed with um, minimalist sculpture when you have to have the spectator kind of interact with that work. And then coming from theater where artists for so long have been um, doing things, of course, outside of theater buildings, but also engaging with with real life, with new ways of, of viewing, seeing, spectating, um, not, necessarily, not necessarily having a, a separation. I mean, um, in just in this century, thinking about invisible theater, Boalian notions of spect actorship or spect participation. Um, and so the notion of off-sites, it's not really new. It's, it's, it's just a, it's ways that artists want to engage with authentic ways of being in community, um, not necessarily always architectural, although that, that, is, that might be a component, but not always. Um, and you were asking me, I think, uh, I don't want to miss the last part of the question. I think you were asking me about the term. Off-sites, uh, simply has to do because I, I've seen so many performances that are happen to be outside of theaters, but they're all super, super different. Uh, and so I was trying to understand what were kind of, how were artists doing it? It wasn't just that I want to go see a show uh, in a hotel and, and I don't know, there's a show in a hotel. Uh, it could very well be that um, there's different forms of engagement. And so there's, or, or this was somebody was, you know, creating a new way of in, uh, merging re reality, real life with actors, with fiction, um, and those worlds would blend. So I was looking really at, you know, all these different approaches uh, to site specificity, what, what you were saying in the beginning about site, site base. So the term off was kind of like, oh, I'm so off it, I'm off site, I'm so done. But really it's more about an offness uh, where, like you, the term offsite is like, oh guys, I'm gonna work offsite. And that's really actually relevant to today. Where we're always offsite, but we're always on. You know, we're, we can never kind of, so it's kind of a conundrum between um, being here and there at the same time. I say this in the intro to the book, my family are immigrants, or for example, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. My family's from Argentina. I, I live in America, in the US. So I'm never quite whole. I'm never quite whole. I'm always here and there at the same time. And that's really something I saw throughout the pieces I was seeing how artists were engaging with space, place, and its historical and sociopolitical context. But at the same time, wanting to kind of unveil something that's hidden. So it's like that here and there at the same time, a notion of like 
never quite a whole, always incomplete. To answer yeah. all, all, all of that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, <clears throat> um, um, with so many um, artists or curators, producers, we talk um, when we say, you know, what 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 is changing? What are we focusing on? And I think there is that turn to that authenticity, that theater of the real. There is the audience participation in that kind of socially engaged art, but there also was the work people point out their relation to community and to the places, the spaces outside what we would call the black box, the Italian style theater. Milo Rao said, my idea for this fall is, and this uh, in the coming spring, let's not do anything inside the theater. Um, so um, what examples have you, you know, have you watched? We say this is an interesting way, of course, it's multiplicity of uh, engagements, but maybe tell us a bit about productions and uh, you have seen or you have looked at, or you feel this, they found something. <laughs> um, well, I th I can think of a couple. Um, I just before I give examples, just to kind of expand on what you were saying about going outside of theater, um, because I think engagement is a really important part of it. Once you, um, let me just backtrack a little bit. In in theater. Um, you know, you have the proscenium at the stage, and I'll give an exa a few examples in a second, but um, that's kind of our frame that we work in. Um, and you can control that. That's, and, and that's the same with, you know, what we might call in, in visual art, the painting where, you know, you frame it and it's plop. And it's very, the objective is to kind of get rid of everything else. Everything is, it's very anti-Brechtian, right? You're, you're like hiding everything that's behind. And so that's where Brecht came in. He wanted to kind of unveil the apparatus that was um, making that function um, as what was happening with the incursion of the spectatorship, uh, engaging with sculpture, let's just say in visual art history. So the second that you want to do work outside the theater or engage the space where audiences differently in the way that's been kind of bogged down to us with a capital T, you are by definition creating different systems of support and engagement. You're, you're engaging with, let's just say the real and different levels of production by definition, because if I wanna go, um, or if an artist, let's say, wants to go do a piece in my home, um, I have to talk to my neighbors. I have to, you know, I, I have to rethink if I'm even going to charge tickets. Like, am I going to bother the neighbor upstairs? And, you know, that's going to be all part of the conversation. Um, and so I can tell, I, I should probably just say it. I went to see a, a show uh, many years ago uh, and the show uh, was a control thing. They wanted to do a theater in the apartment um, in order and it was something about memory and I can't quite remember exactly the name of the company, but you know, they wanted the, the show is like, once you open the door, there are the actors in the kitchen and the actor goes to the bathroom. And so you follow, you know, it's very private, intimate space, only five spectators at a time. But what ended up happening is that those artists didn't take into account the fact that this happened in a co-op building in New York City. Um, and so how were you gonna get, you know, you couldn't really tell the neighbors. It was like this whole thing that had to be, let's just say hidden. So, so that's the real, right? Infiltrating the fiction. And so then what happens is that, you know, people were kind of sitting in the lobby and then other residents complained and the, you know, what ended up happening is that the guard who happened to work in the building got in trouble. and. So, so there's real repercussions to, you know, this kind of autonomous realm of the artwork that that need to be that should I think um, become part of the work. So production is not a separate realm; it should be part of the aesthetics. Um, and you were asking me, I think the second part of your question was um, to give examples of things I've seen. So uh, sure, I mean, I can think of. I guess two off the top of my head, um, like a few years, I think it was 2018, I was in Bahia, Brazil, FIAC, it's an international theater festival and they had invited, um, Rumini Protocol did a, a piece uh, that they've done around the world. I don't love all their pieces, but this one was amazing, Home Visit. 
uh, and it was, they had developed a game tailored to every location that would be performed because it wasn't really, I mean, it was a game, they, they created a situation. This is the notion about off-sites. It's not always a, a performance, a show. It's sometimes an orchestration of a situation, a way of having a conversation. And this, this was a game about capitalism in Bahia and we would, and it was at a person's house. So the host of that really home would invite us to their home and we would play a game that was quite orchestrated um, through the dramaturgy that Romanian Protocol had set up. And I think they've recorded, um, they did like a map of all the answers to the questions based on, you know, real people, I guess, participants, notions of what that game was. That's one example. Uh, and of course, there's, uh, I mean, I love the work of John Malpe and LAPD, Los Angeles Poverty Department, who's been doing um, incredible work uh, using um, artists um, that have uh, lost their homes and they've been working, they've done pieces around the notion of drugs and narcotics. They've done uh, a work called RFK and EKY, which was a reenactment um, of Robert Kennedy's um, poverty tour uh, right before the Bush election. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but that was something that where their engagement was for many years. Uh, the show is not just a simple actual show. It, it, it's a whole process of, of, you know, being on site to talk about like a historical moment um, uh, in order to talk about the future. Mm. So it's a it radically different engagement with the idea of theater. When we now think, oh, when will theater reopen? When will the off Broadway and off off, you know, where we present the, the great plays of the world? Mm. Um, would you say, uh, wait a minute, think through what what are you what you're doing, and uh, is that a moment to to perhaps present work that doesn't need all these spaces? Um. Yes, <laughs> um, I, I the, the first thing that came to my mind when you made that comment is I'm thinking about my students that are studying that are playwrights uh, and how they're thinking about what writing is for the theater, because now for the theater doesn't necessarily mean on a stage in a proscenium, it could be through some technology, you know, it, it, it now involves different forms of uh, technology. Uh, it, it could be in different spaces occurring at the same time. So the idea of writing plays for a proscenium is definitely changing, just even in the notion of play itself, the, they are incorporating um, this off-sidedness all the time. You could write a play that occurs in different locations at the same time. You could write a play that engages with, um, that has different forms of engagement uh, or that distributes itself through different medium, for example. I don't know if I'm being too abstract. <clears throat> no, 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 I think, um, you know, also for that, let's, for theater companies or theater artists listening now, I think that idea of the off, off-site, um, of course, it's something in COVID, you know, that is actually working and possible. We just had, you know, the Cherry Arts Project. And they said, yeah, we did our play, a Goldoni, kind of unknown one. We did it, of course, outside, not in our space. And uh, they adapted masks, uh, surgical masks, for your comedia mask. And else, but they did it in a way, you know, and engaged, I think, with the housing departments where they played it and the community and ever. And so it was, if I understand, quite, quite popular. Would you say, um, to theater artists uh, now that this is a form, so what you wrote about, of course, before Corona, but this is a form that actually can successfully be adapted and should be taken serious. So don't wait till you get back in the black box. Use a form that has been proven of, uh, of, of interest, you know, to scholars in the field and theater artists. Yes, we talk again, yes. Uh, so, so all the time, um, it's this, if, if you are taking for granted that theater, you know, means this and you don't question the form, then we're gonna be stuck with the same thing 
all the time. But that's the beauty of art is that it's not just about the content, it's about the form. And so, uh, you know, why do you, you know, do you need an audience member? How many do you need? Where do they have to be? How are you going to engage with them? Um, uh, you know, and that, that question of where they have to be um, is very important. They don't, you could be in many places at the same time now, which has to do with distribution of your, you know, it could be film or not film. I mean, I'm going like this because I, you know, you're far away and I'm here. Um, uh, you, you know, so, so in, in other words, the thinking about the theaters, what, what you're saying about Milo Rao, like it, it's really a whole event. It's about dramaturgy is now implicated into the event of theater. Um, you, and, and so questioning every single facet of that is very important, um, which just in, in architecture is just one part of it because the notion of sightedness um, is not just physical, like I'm at this site working. Um, it can involve a conversation. It can be a discursive site that you're interested in. It can be um, something you experience. So uh, sometimes this is just for example, sometimes I would go to see a show that happens, I don't know, outside in a sidewalk, but it's not so much the sidewalk that's important. It's um, it could be sure related to the history of the space, but very often it happened to be outside because the artist was more interested in, in a conversation that related to that community. And they wanted to stage a situation that engaged people of that community to, it, to have a, a conversation, for example. Um, so, so to go back to your question about theater and you know artists, and no, um, Yes, the. It, it's a whole event. I remember being at a panel a long time ago on uh, at APAP of all places. I think Philip Byther was talking about curating. Um, uh, they, they it, I think it was a panel with like Ralph Lemon and uh, Wesleyan has a program. I don't know if it still exists. That's called. I think it does. It's called. Um, something about curating performance, et cetera, et cetera. And and most of the people in the room were. Um, artistic directors of repertory theaters. And um, Philip Byther was trying to, who's a curator at, for performance at the Walker Art Center, uh, was trying to kind of share that, or, or, or uh, yeah, share that, you know, it, you, we can get out of this booking a season philosophy. Um, why not? have one show all year that's durational in time or you know why not like the national I mean he wasn't saying it, but for example National Theatre of Scotland is a theatre without walls so was the Foundry by the way who just they just um, finished with their last project which was a book um, that's one of their projects so that you can found a theatre um, of course without walls and that will get you to think otherwise or um, they got theatre uh, with directed by Eric Alada. I mean, they, uh, based in the South of France, for example, their projects are not based, just like Foundry. It's not like, we're gonna do this show in this theater. They start with an idea and then it develops. It could could be a, a video, it could be a walk. They do a lot of audio, um, um, audio walks. Uh, so it depends on the idea that the artist wants to do, but theater can exist anywhere. Mm. And in a way, it has a closeness in a way to the visual arts, right? Um, as part of the home for uh, off-site, would you say that? Well, I think what's, um, okay, well, since you're mentioning visual arts, I think what's, there's good and bad things. In, in terms of the visual arts, I think what they have encouraged historically um, is both mo much more of a um, uh, engagement with with theory uh, and artists thinking theoretically or abstractly about what art is. So in their in their work, uh, and so that has shaped, you know, conceptual art, institutional critique, uh, uh, social practice based works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, I think we're at a 
wonderful advantage in the theater part of it because our work is people-based, it is communal-based, it is social practice by definition. So all these kind of new forms, and I say new because, you know, in the visual arts, whether they call it ephemeral practices or, you know, um, that's what that's what we're good at. Um, so yes, I, I think a lot of the most interesting artists and the ones I write about in the book um, are engaging with, with kind of a mixture of both. And, um, looking at uh, using the theatrical practices they have very well through through new conceptual frameworks. Hmm. Um, let's say um, the living theaters, street performances, uh, Brat and Puppet or Schachner did work, I think also in the diner, um, um, the Wooster did work outside and um, and so do you detect, is there something in the, in the 21st century, is there something that changed or is it a continuation? Of, is something new happening in, um, in that field you look at, at the upsides? Is there something that has, uh, has changed compared to the traditional avant-garde in that sense? So offsites is simply the terminology I use um, to engage with site-based practices. Um, mm -hmm. like, uh, but yes, Site-based practices have changed a lot since the, especially since the 80s. That's the first time I kind of heard it. Uh, I think historically in theater, that, that's the first time the term was used. Uh, I heard it, uh, I mean, I was gonna say in the UK, it was perhaps used a little earlier, but the term used to kind of be environmental theater and then on guard, on guard arts, Annie Hamburger um, started using the term probably because she comes from a visual arts background. Um, uh, but it used to be a Meredith Monk uh, and a lot of people in dance. We should mention that a lot of uh, this has been going on with dance for quite a while. Um, Charles Mee was writing plays, um, you know, that were site specific uh, to be directed. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. The 21st century changed. It, it used to be kind of large scale pieces where you would um, where artists were interested in staging things, as you were saying, outside of theaters as a production where people could have access, I guess, to places that were closed or abandoned or, and they tended to be large, um, large scale. Reza Abdo is very important here in this history, um, who staged uh, along with On Guard Arts. Uh, father was a peculiar man uh, in, the, in the 90s. So that was, you know, big then. And, um, Absolutely, we've seen, uh, we've gone through right now, especially in the last 10 years, kind of more intimate performances, no sets uh, using, I mean, for lack of a better word, like the real life. So for example, um, I saw a piece by Big At Theater uh, directed by Erica Lata that was Hidden Stories, um, where you kind of followed, it. It was, it was not long ago here, but it was created a while back. Um, and I saw it in Fort, no, not in Fort Greene, downtown Brooklyn, where there, I think there were like five actors and you, you put on headphones and you, you individually kind of observed the inner world of these performers. Um, and they would go, anybody else in this, in, in, the neighborhood wouldn't know that a performance was going on because they just kind of blended in unless you had the headphones. I hope you're understanding what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, and and um, the other one was uh, Anne Hampton's, well, also Rotozaza that the Foundry produced um, in, uh, in a cafe. Um, and Anne Hampton did the library piece. I think PS122 uh, produced that in uh, a library. So. Actually, the library one is a really good example of, it was just two audience members at a time. You would go to a library, they would give you a headphone and you simply, they go through this kind of staging of books by yourself and the library becomes your stage. And it's a form of invisible theater. Nobody else, you're in a show. There's no actors, you're your own performer. Um, and. So, so I hope you're seeing, like, so the shift went from kind of experimental staging practices to more experiential situations created by the artists. Um, yeah. 
that were so, that are sometimes more invisible and more of an infiltration of the real and fiction in that sense. So, and, and in that sense, since you mentioned visual art, I think that there was much more of an engagement or fluidity between what was going on in the visual arts um, and what was going on theatrically. Hmm. I mean, you make a clear distinction between site specific and off site. Maybe t tell us a little bit why you felt it needed an update that that field or the term for it. So, okay. I'm not, I, I just want to make it clear, I'm not like categorizing something as offsite or not offsite. Um, I was simply using the word, the approach offsite, uh, being here and there at the same time, like a, introducing a kind of offness to contemporary practices that move beyond the site specific. So, whereas before, and Robert Smithson from Visual Art talks about this difference and we can maybe have more specific examples Richard Serra the famous tilted artwork that happened um, in Lower Manhattan that was site specific right if you move the work you would destroy it um, but we've gone we've you know we've gone much more than that even visual arts you can have site-based work that tours um, and it's the artist that travels um, or you have pieces that are made locally at different places so the, the notion of sightedness went from being very grounded. Um, Mi Wong Kwon talks about this in visual art history. Um, her book is, 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 is precisely about that, but coming from visual arts. Um, and, and in theater, so we, we go from site specificity to site-based practices that, but again, that don't prioritize location or architecture necessarily as the most important part. So to give you an example, I'm going back to John Malpied, um, who, who did the piece RFK and EKY. Yes, uh, LAPD had to do that piece. Um, oh my God, uh, uh, in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, RFK, EKY, right? Because that's where, but, but, and of course it's site specific because you cannot not do it anywhere else. But the engagement, um, the participatory element, the durational component, the way you engage with the piece, those are just as important, if not more. And the off-sidedness, off in that chapter, I just talk about temporalities, the notion of time, because by using that site, he's bringing us to an off time, like a, 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 you know, engaging with a different time in order to, to, to move forward. So playing, that it's it's a it's I'm just using the word off sites as a way to kind of recognize the varied approaches that artists are using um, when they're engaging with site in this mm -hmm. conceptual way. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is a big contribution. And by the way, John Malpe is the brother of Karen Malpe, you know, the yeah, playwright. Yeah, he's yeah, the, he's the, you know, he was quite, a, quite a theatrical family. Yes, I really admired also the work for decades, what they have done and uh, work, you know, highlighting, you know, the complex uh, history of uh, immigration and the political um, fights for civil rights and how they how they were able to, re they recreated the march, right? They, um, people, they, um, it had some actors representing um, Kennedy, but also civil rights, and they went through through the landscape, through the towns, and um, so. But when it comes to validation, I think you know with plays, there are you know the Tonys, there are the Obies, and this and that. This is you know what we've been taught and what people achieve for. In the offside world, I think it's a bit it's more complicated, right? It doesn't have a real footing or feel, even now in academia i think you're one of the very few writing about there of course others but um, also in producing i know andrew kercher who is a uh, uh, also studied at the graduate center and was hired at the public theater because they found out we can produce we know how to produce a play but they had no idea how to produce you know something that's off the site and a remedy protocol came to the brooklyn public library for the under the radar and they thought, oh, they have Wi-Fi at the library. Of course, you know, that's fine. We can chat with it. And, and, and uh, Remini said, no, this is not professional. Of course, this will not work. And also, there were complications with it. So um, so that whole field is complicated uh, in a way. And that's perhaps why it is not as much in the center as it, uh, as it should be. Do you think 
that from observing the field is it a wave that's going away do you see more it will more we will see more work especially now in covid time or do you think uh, it will um, not gain as strong a foothold perhaps as the forms of theater we are traditionally look at okay so the short answer to your question is uh yes it's gonna only get bigger um yes i think theaters with a capital T, I don't know, Lincoln Center. I mean, St. Anne's Warehouse has been, you know, engaging with this, but P BAM actually, the, 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 the engage a lot with offsite um, performance, but more and more theaters will have to go out and look for uh, new, not only new spaces because new spaces by definition, when an artist engages with new spaces, they're engaging with new forms of theater. So it's just going to get bigger and bigger, and not in scale. I mean, in the amount of artists looking for new ways of engaging with theater practice. Um, and yeah, institutions are going to have to accommodate and therefore change their producing dramaturgies or the way they produce. Um, it goes hand in hand, aesthetics and production. Are, are, are not, again, separate things, as Annie Hamburger has um, kind of shown from our arts, or even um, Melanie Joseph from the Foundry Theater. Um, but what's important about your question, besides the fact that, yes, this is just going to get more, uh, I don't know, bigger, more. Mm -hmm. yeah, more, more, more artists are going to engage more with this kind of work is that uh, questioning more what theater with a capital T is and inventing new forms. And uh, by the way, as Cantor said, you have to get out of theater in order to make theater, uh, you know, or invent new forms of theater. Um, sometimes you have to kind of get out of the meeting in order to discover what it is to see it or look at it differently from a different angle. But um, this is going to have a huge impact. And this, I mean, this is why I got into writing about curating and, and producing because um especially with with curating practices it's and going back to what i said before about you can't just like think of it like oh i'm going to book my season this play then this play then this play you have to shift the, the the way that events what events are and who they're for and who are you inviting you know um it, it's not and, and this actually has to do with the diversity question and the whole notion of um you know, rethinking our institutions and who they're for, because it's not about bringing this diverse, you know, black playwright into your company. You have to reshift, like, you know, who is the institution really representing? You, you know, it's not like band, you know, fixing a, a thing with a band aid. You have to like heal from the inside. From you know what I'm saying? And so this is gonna, this is that moment. Corona is gonna have to do that um, because it's ha it has shown, um, for lack of a better word, like how unequal, um, you know, and unsustainable the system is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Short answer during, to your question. And also not functioning, right? The big houses are closed. They're not set up. Mm -hmm. If they were set up with an arm for off-site work, if you call it, they would be still being out there producing in the parks, on the street, like in small units, right? Well, I mean, I think that the artists are not going to wait for institutions to produce them. You know, I think that the artists are creating new ways to do work and the, and, you know, if the, I, you know, they're going to be their own institutions, it's going to be from the ground up. There's going to be grassroots movements that are building up and, you know, those established or I guess formally established institutions are going to have to, you know, it's going to be something like this. They're going to have to, not impose, but see you know, mm. what people are building from the from the DIY movement to kind of shift their producing models. We're not, I mean, we can't just have artistic directors who are there for 20, 30 years. They, you know, we need new blood every few years. It, it doesn't, you know, and it doesn't have to be vertical, it can be horizontal. I mentioned National Theater of... Um, Scotland? Yes. Uh, before that is an institution that has always been horizontal, meaning equal partnerships, equal um, authorial uh, control over. It's not like one person picking, not, not a star curator or a star artistic. That's old. That's mm -hmm. that's not going to be the. They also decided not to have a space. They said not to have a space. 
land of Scotland. We go everywhere. We go in existing places, you know, also I was just Marco, looking... Edinburgh, who should get it? They said, yeah. no, we are mobile. It's a mobile, it's, a, it's an mobile. incredible conceptual and run by artists and created by artists, actually not through a government structure of the, the, the city. It really has a say in what they want. You know, that's the thing. They're, they're, it's not like I'm commissioning this artist to do, you know, some idea. It's like, what does the community need? What do they, I mean, not what they, you know, what are they asking for? Um, and not subscribers, you know, not mm -hmm. that whole model. I'm not sure how long that's going to last. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great model, and uh, but I think uh, off sites, of course, is something in this time of Corona. I think already it was, I think, a very significant field, but I hope it will uh, also um, get more attention. Also, the significance of it as an artistic imp impression expression, as an uh, as you said, authentic way to engage with the creation of meaning for the artist, but also for the audiences. Um, it has something um, that. Um, um, is unique and powerful and perhaps, uh, you know, like theater of the real, the entrance of the, uh, uh, the, the spectator, the normal person, the expert of the everyday, as Romani says, into theater productions, but also then the notion of the off side that happens to be perhaps also outside, but it's not defined by the space. It is more uh, an experience, often more intimate, as you said, you know, of a moment of life and a moment of uh, deep reflection that perhaps helps us to look in a different way. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go on. No, 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 that you mentioned a word that I think is really crucial and it's what experience, uh, I guess as artists, do we want to, you know, create? So it, again, it goes back to that notion of content. Um, I'm thinking back to, uh, Phil Soltanoff, an artist I, I worked with, I had the opportunity to work with so many years ago, but I, I really, really admire his work. Um, and yes, he was doing things uh, or engaging with spaces that perhaps were not in theater, but more than that, it's that he was looking for new ways to experience or to create an event for the audience, for the performer, um, you know, like, we questioning again the form um uh not to take it for granted um mm. and, and yeah always in ways that were integral to to what he was researching in the work yeah no it's a great I, if i not mix up i remember his piece i think it was in the parking lot where he taped a square you know and performers and actors were standing outside, almost like in a soccer game where you say, you have, this is the white line. If you're sitting on the bench, even as a great player, you don't do anything, but you get into the game, you step over that white light, white line, you are in the game, you perform, you do things, and then it's over. And the, he did this, I think, in a parking lot. And then, you know, pe pe people I, stepped into it and over it, dance, or dancers, and it wasn't clear who, if I, yeah. In five miles, I think it was, um peter well not uh what was it called um not the hour I forget the name of it now the but hour. It's a great a great great concept my question is Addy, in the time of corona do you think and um, we talked about this also here that you know theaters often have ballet uh, uh, drama opera you know, we said, we wonder, will there be the digital division? Theaters in Germany now hire um, digital dramaturgs. I think we spoke with someone from Augsburg. That's her job. She's a dramaturg just for the digital new department they are creating because they say it's here, it's going to stay. Who knows if the next Corona comes or not, but we're going to engage in that art. Um, do you feel, do you think that theaters, uh, instead of you know, letting the artists doing themselves. Shouldn't institutions host uh, artists, open the space? I mean, Helen Shaw yesterday said, what I hope for is that big institutions will open for artists, for small institutions, open the space, say, do what you want, we help you. Um, but do you think uh, that movement will come, as you said, independently, or do you think there has to be a serious support from existing institutions to this art form, which is contemporary, which is new, which is emerging? and of uh, significance because it has to do with our times. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Yes, um, but it, it, what you're talking about, I think has to do with funding perhaps or um, uh, indirectly, which is something I had forgot to mention in the question before about 
uh, sure, with institutions or established institutions, what comes is, um, you know, funding. Uh, and, and one of the issues that we have, and I, I'll answer your question about yes, because I think they have to open their spaces and think, you know, wider and bigger conceptually. Um, but it's also uh, when we, because you had mentioned OBs and awards and Tonys, um, the categories of awards that we have are incredibly outdated. Yeah. Um, the uh, because they're so compartmentalized about um, you know what what a theater who a theater artist is that they they don't take into account in their interdisciplinarity of what contemporary theater has become and and that has to do also with the judges um, uh, you know who are hired for the or whatever or who represent you know whether they're playwrights or not or I mean I've been in panels where I'm the only theater person and everybody else comes from visual art and unless that um, artist is you know challenging theater forms they're not going to get uh, funded or awarded and vice versa I've also been in panels where the other panels were, were, were very classically trained or, or, or coming from very literary drama notions of theater. Um, and so, for example, if you weren't an amazing playwright and you were a performer, you weren't going to get the award. So, so the categories are some things that we're going to have to play around with. Um, just as, yes, institutions, I think that to your question about uh, how we're going to see a shift in theater, I guess, I mean, I don't know in Broadway because it's all going to depend on economically how their needs, commercial theater and non-commercial theater works very differently. But ultimately it has to do with um, how open you, you, you want to be with funding. And, you know, are we still going to have, you know, the Broadway and creative capital? And, you know, it, it, it's so, it's almost so um, predictable. So something's got to shift because I think even I see the new artists, they're, they're, you know, the younger generation, they're, they're not going to be, you know, um, playing the game the same way. They're going to change it. They're going to change the game. Mm. So I don't know yeah. if that answers your question. No, but. it's true. It, I think it has to change and also it will change. And we are maybe already, it has changed. It's not, not visible yet. And I think your book, The Offsides, is, you know, shows us a little bit of some rules of the game or shows us the map on where those games could take place with lots of uh, areas um, um, also then to um, to discover. So I think it is really a significant uh, thought that these times where you cannot get into the space and they're suffering, they said there are other possibilities. And as you said, companies like the Foundry, LAPD and Los Angeles and others, you know, have said even in the time, in the supposedly good times, say, no, we don't want that space. You know, it's like a... Uh, uh, Men Ray, the great artist, also conceptual artist, who was a great landscape painter, but as he started out, but he said, no, it's no longer an appropriate expression of the time I live in, where we have, you know, radio, phonograph, uh, typewriters, we had at that time, cars, airplanes. He said, you know, we have to be different. And he moved, you know, into the solarization and installation and the abstract art as an expression that is connected to the time. And I think this is after all what art has to be doing it has to help us to create meaning and in a way prepare us also for all the changes and make us comfortable with it and see uh, what is much good about it what hasn't been there before while of course also preserving existing forms but um, so yeah so really really thank you for your work i encourage everybody to um to also check out um what you're doing i hear also in the in the corona time you, you had some uh, activities that were not connected fully to to theater uh, as a in, in the business idea if i can ask you is that true yes um so <laughs> this is because frank and i are friends outside of the martin siegel um with my girlfriends we started um um we a mezcal brand where of course everybody's a little bit into drinking so uh, uh, two of my friends are from Mexico um, and one has been to Oaxaca quite a few times so if you're a mezcal lover um, we'll see if it comes to fruition but the idea is to um, start a small label of mezcal with women palenqueras. Palenqueras are the ones that um, make the mezcal so also kind of a new way of um, creating a mezcal brand where Part of the proceeds go to the um, families who produce them. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, and who knows, one day you might come up where that uh, off-site uh, off experience mezcal. is connected to mezcal that if I remember right, has some kind of psychedelic, tiniest bit of psychedelic uh, uh, additions um, that may be in, in it and it is very different. So that, that's quite interesting, but also it shows, you know, as you say, the idea of the experience in the loneliness which we experience now in the solitude, you know, and the, also um, that perhaps there is something to experience and something like like um, that, that, you know, it connects us to an inner world and we look so much, everything comes from the outside world relentlessly. And, uh, and I think we need to connect to our inner worlds. And I think actually that kind of off side really does, especially as you said, in the experiences of the walk around the audio tour, the, you know, being uh, alone, but among others, so questioning reality, but having a dialogue in a way also then uh, with yourself where you are the performer, it's a radical difference than well, being the consumer. Yeah, and since you mentioned digital, um, I think it was La Jolla Playhouse, they have like a site-specific festival and uh, they had to change because of Corona, of course, because of the lockdown, we couldn't even go anywhere outside. Um, but uh, Marike um, Splint did this fantastic performance all online live called You Are Here that I believe is still accessible. Uh, you know, even though I saw it live online, um, uh, the way she engaged with Google Maps and the digital sphere, it was very site specific to the condition that we're living in. Um, mm. but, yeah, so no, I really, I really do think that that is a, a very significant outcome. And I would encourage everybody who creates theater and performance, you know, to really think about this form, especially in the upcoming year. We need, uh, uh, there's a thirst, a hunger, a necessity, necessity as for me and many others, you know, to see work, engage with it, uh, to um, have this kind of, uh, someone said they would, apocalypsis. Calypsis really means revelation in the original meaning of the divine on the earth or something, you know, that you take the lid off of something. So to reveal to us also the mysteries and the miracles of life, as John Cage said about his art. And um, this is a way, instead of, you know, um, not doing anything, or th if you are around a theater, you have fans, instead of saying, we cannot do anything in our theater, this is a way to employ artists, to engage an audience, and to really experiment and find a new form that perhaps might, as you said, inform the practice itself. You have to go outside sometimes in a form, and then you return to this is a moment and there are possibilities and it's great 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 work really um, has been done and uh, by all these um, artists David Levine and uh, Marina Bramovich and and so so many others who worked uh, in that field um, uh, Maud Le Floc, and I don't know if you have other names you know what people should look at are there other artists you feel look at their work uh, well like I I, I... Marika Splint's piece, You Are Here, is fantastic. Um, yeah, sure, David Levine was doing work um, before. I'm not sure what he's working in not now. At the moment, but in the parks, yeah, where he did before. Uh, yeah. Puppetry, I think, you know, also, there are these, the Gulliver's Travel, you know, that great company. Um, oh, yeah, and, yeah uh, who did gigantic performances you know in a way um, on the streets and why not do something what people in their homes from their windows can watch oh, maybe they don't yeah, even have to be on the street you know I think in ferguson i saw that also via zoom that was quite powerful i mean the way they're reinventing the notion of sightedness via the zoom mechanism that was quite engaging um, who was that what company theater. oh work okay. mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. So when, I know that Offsides already is a couple of years. When did you write? Two years ago it came out? It came out in 2018. 18, yeah, two years. Wow. How, how, There's how, probably how. much more updated artists. Yeah. yeah, I think you should keep it updated. I think it's a significant field and it should be taught. It should be produced. There should be the OB Award for, for Off's best uh, uh, Offside work and the Tony and whatever and the Oscar. But... Um, uh, what, what are you working on now? What's what? What are you looking at? What are you doing? What am I working? Uh, I'm shifting gears, but I think it's uh, related because I'm always fascinated about what, um, how the art infiltrates the real, um, and vice versa. So, um, been now shifted to looking at vulnerabilities and precarity um, within theater, and and specifically like actor training and actor training and playing also in children. 
Um, what, why is something, uh, you know, how is opening up to vulnerability uh, provide a, a new form of presence or authenticity? So it's totally new, but it's around the notion of vulnerability and precarity in performance, whether it be through actors or playing or, or the performance or engagement of, of, mm. of the space. And how is that connected to offsite? You said it's connected. It's not oh, it's only connected indirectly in what my interests around theater are because I'm always interested in when fiction and real, you know, when they kind of, when you don't have a separation between art and life. So um, they're both connected, but it's not really, it's, it's a totally different project. It's a different construction site, even though you have experience um, from the other. We're coming close to the end um, of the talk, we always ask that uh, twofold. That one is, uh, what would you say? What do you say to your young students now? Uh, what should they be doing next year? What should what should theater artists be doing? I really would like to hear from you. And then, what are you reading or listening to? What inspires you at the moment? Um, what, the first question is, what should they be? What should theater artists do? Oh, young artists oh, oh, or okay. people who cannot work or at home? What do you say? Oh, they, What's your practical they, advice? What do you say? What do you do? You I also run a company. They right? should ask big questions, they should ask questions, question everything. And that gets you to thinking differently about um, how you're engaging with the form. So I would say constantly ask yourself uh, what's challenging now um, and work through questions around that. And that's gonna, you know, get you no work, no, I mean, no pain, no gain, like go get through the hard spots and that's gonna make your art much stronger. Um, and the second one was, my, oh, I happen to be reading, uh, I don't know the full title, but it's Love by Bell Hooks. It's about um, it's kind of an older book. I think it's 10 years old. Um, it's really beautiful. I'm halfway through. Halfway. It's about the lack of love in our contemporary culture. Okay, <laughs> good. So, well, Bertie, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm sorry we pushed you to come on our show in the middle of your uh, crazy uh, sprint at the end of the semester, but I felt that is such an important and significant uh, contribution and uh, we should have much more. Perhaps also we could make maybe a series a week, you know, with international artists who work in that field and listen to them and hear what they are doing, how they are doing it and why. Yeah, and, uh, but it is certainly a form that is uh, valuable and also possible. And in that time we live in at the moment, it has some answers that found something in it. But as you said, it has a very, very long tradition. It's morphing, of course, into you know, different contexts, forms and shapes. But, um, but it is something um, that is possible, doable, and also, I think, necessary at the moment. So thank you for highlighting it with us. Thank you for thank writing you. the book and for uh, researching it. and giving attention to the field. And, um, and um, that you also did this. I know there are so many dissertation things about the contemporary American playwrights and Kushner, and you've said, no, I'm going to work on that. That is important. And you focused on that very early on. And I think it proved to be um, um, of significance and importance. So really, thank you. Thanks for, um, for having me all around yeah, for, um, for hosting us. Uh, and uh, we're going to see all of you um, next week and um and have a great great weekend and uh yeah think about uh, the next book on on offsite uh, off uh, updated in a couple of years from now and i think it's an important uh, field so thank you so much and i uh, hope you all will stay safe it's as we know it's a devastating moment it's up to three thousand people dying each day it's uh, a disastrous but it really in time also to really think as Bertie said question everything what are we doing and why and um, it is an important time. We have Alejo Gantner with us uh, um, next um, next week, uh, who will uh, talk about producing, creating. He did the great PS122 stand was with stories with the um, um, Onassis um, Foundation. And um, then we have uh, Hillary Miller, who will talk with us about the time when New York City also experienced um, a terrible, um, terrible, terrible. Uh, 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 time in the city it was devastating was bankrupt and perhaps you know, when we look around in midtown it is a similar moment and then we have martin k green um uh, with us um and ken uh, janiglia from lmda the literary manager and dramaturgist association of new york 
uh, of the Americas, and um, we will hear about uh, their work, what is going on, and also they did a lot of outreach to Mexico and uh, the work in uh, of dramaturgs uh, in this field, where your discourse also really uh, matters so much when it comes to curation and the offsides and and really looking at the structures of theater. And as you said, I think we cannot forget what Bright said and Hannah Muller: a theater itself represents as government, a structure, the powers uh, at be, and we also have to be critical of it, or at least be aware of it, and uh, not just feeding the machine, but uh, also questioning it. And then uh, and, uh, if we do, do this, uh, as Hannah Muller said, without criticizing it, it's treason to the original idea of theater and the performance where we work through problems, as, complex issues in society, in our lives, in our families, in our communities. So it is actually of, uh, I think, essential, essential importance. So thank you all. I'm sorry if I talk too much today, uh, uh, because I, but I'm very passionate about this, uh, this field also. It's an important one, and um, I hope this was a contribution to also highlight it. Thank you so much, Patty, and... Uh... Thank you.